Welcome to Habs Unfiltered, episode 248. I'm your host, Blaine Pudvay, and I'm joined now by my co-host, Matt Smith. Good evening. And Treg Wilson. Hello. Blaine, did you just mess up your own name? Yes. I don't, I don't feel so bad now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been a long day here. Long day. I'm oh. going to say all the names wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm unimportant. I'm self-aware. Uh, all right. So today's episode, we're going to talk about the uh, Ottawa game and all the little knickknacks that come with it. Uh, Gallagher's comments and whatnot. Uh, there's also comments made by Guy Boucher about uh, Nick Suzuki. We'll discuss that as well. Uh, we'll start it off with a quick injury Roundup. Uh, Barron was hurt in the last game. Uh, he he had a player fall down and roll. Uh, he kind of rolled his ankle, so he didn't travel to New Jersey. Uh, in his place, it looks like Weidman's stepping in. So, you know, hopefully Barron's feeling better soon. Uh, Clegg is returning from injury, so he'll be taking Harris's spot. And that's pretty much it. Price is on the tri- on the road trip, which means he's getting closer to playing. Paul that, that's good news. Staying. Paul Byron staying in Montreal too. Yeah, he's he's also injured. Um, but yeah, Price is on the trip, and it looks like he's going to play a couple of games before the end of the season. And if anyone's concerned about salary cap issues, the Canadians have about ten ten and a half million cap space. They can fit him in. So that's, that's good news. Um, <clears throat> but we'll start with the, uh, the Guy Boucher comments. So on RDS uh, yesterday, Guy Boucher was having a discussion, a short one, uh, and they brought up the younger players. They talked about Cole Caulfield. They talked about uh, Justin Barron. And then when, he brought, uh, when they brought up Nick Suzuki, Guy Boucher basically called him a third-line center. So my question to the two of you is, was he drunk or was he stoned when he thought this? Go ahead, Drake. Uh, probably a little bit of both. Um, mind you, he did say a third line center on a contend- contending team. Um, so who contending would does has two centers that are better – than Suzuki playing right now. Like we kind of have to split the Montreal Canadian season this year into two different type seasons because there's such a drastic change. We're going to get into this later with Martin St. Louis as Dom Ducharme. Um, so if you take the St. Louis Suzuki, uh, he's a top line center. He's a, he, that's, that's what he is. That's what he's playing. Like um, he's, Still got a little bit of work to go, but I mean, uh, he's at least a second line center on, I would say, a contending team. Like maybe Edmonton to be a third line center just because of Dreisaitl and McDavid, but uh, on most teams, he's at least a second line center, at least a second line center. I don't understand this whole contending team third line center thing because he was the first line center of a team that went to the Stanley Cup final and he was the key component up the middle for that run. I know uh, Deno took on a lot of responsibility, but uh, let's be honest, Suzuki carried them offensively up the middle. No, and that's that's true. Like, I, I'm just saying, like, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here and see where yeah. he's coming from. But even to me, even on a contending team, okay, you're still looking at at least first or second line center. Yeah, maybe Toronto because they have Matthews and Tavares. And, and that's or, why I said like Edmonton with Dreisaitl and uh, McDavid. Yeah, or uh, Pittsburgh, who yeah, have... Pittsburgh, or Flo- Pittsburgh Florida, uh, I mean, Washington, those kind, of, those kind of teams. Well, right? even Washington, I would say he's a second-line center. Yeah. He'd take Kuznetsov's place, no problem. Only Baxter would be ahead of him, I would say. Yep. Boston, like it's, it's very few teams, like three or four teams at all, uh, at most, because they have and, and, ridiculous center depth. 
And you could say that to almost any player, top line center on any team that's not on their team. You could say, well, you know, is Backstrom going to play higher than Tavares and Matthews on Toronto? Probably not. <laughs> you know what I mean? So Backstrom's a third line center on a contending team. There you go. He has a cup ring too. Well, then Toronto would win the cup if he was there. So <laughs> Matt, what do you think of his uh, of uh, Guy Boucher's comments? I think he was looking for attention, to be honest. And as we've discussed, Suzuki's pretty much the second line center on any team in the league. And uh, I just think he was looking for his moment in the sun when he made that comment. I just don't think it was uh, it was warranted, especially with the way the season's gone. However, with the turnaround, we've seen that uh, these young players have really taken off, especially Suzuki. So I just think that they were a little bit. Uh, I just think it was the right thing to say at the at this time. Give the guy a, give the guy a year under a coach that uh, can adapt to the situation around him, and we'll see what happens. For a guy to um, to be leading his team right now in scoring, um, you know he hasn't missed a game yet. Good on him. He's I, the I, only uh, only player in the Canadians' entire system yeah. to not miss and, a game. Yeah, and he's only you know he's averaging over twenty minutes a game. He's uh, he's got 51 points this year. Like, yeah, he's not he's not out there crushing 100 point seasons or anything like that. But he's going in the right direction, and so is the team. And I think the off is going to be um, uh, it's going to be a major turnaround for this team. And I think we're going to see a lot of moving pieces. And uh, Suzuki's going to come back even stronger next season. I mean, the whole 100 point season thing. I, I don't understand. It, you can be a first line center without being that offensively Absolutely. gifted. Absolutely. Like you look at Boston, Bergeron. Yep. He, I think he hit 100 points once, and he's a point per game player a few times. Yep. But that's not why he's the number one center. He's there because he can play defense. I can and, see a, like a like a right like right now Suzuki 51 points in 70 games. Uh, he's looking at hitting probably just over 60 for the season. Next year, um, big contract starts up when he starts making the 7.8, there's going to be extra pressure on him. There's going to be changes, as I said, during the, uh, during the off season, or at least you hope so. We don't know who they're going to draft, where they're going to, where they're going to fit in the draft. Obviously that's going to come into, uh, into play as well. But um, I'm looking at Suzuki next season more. I'm thinking a 65 to 70 points, 65 to 75 point season isn't out of, uh, isn't out of, uh, isn't out of range. Those are pretty good numbers for a uh, for a first line center, especially, yeah, especially one that can play. Especially one that can play in all situations on a rebuilding team. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, from Guy Boucher, a former coach of the Ottawa Senators, to the Ottawa Senators game, the Canadians played the Senators. Uh, they lost six three. It was um, an interesting game, to say the least. The Canadians started very strong. They looked really good. Gallagher actually won a video review. So mark your calendars, folks. That happened. You weren't dreaming. Uh, but then the Canadians kind of tailed off. So, Matt, what, what did you see there that you liked and disliked? I liked, uh, I liked how Gallagher played. He played with a little bit of an edge. He was... He was um he was in on every play, but obviously by the end, he was pretty damn frustrated, just like the rest of us were. Um, the game in total, you know, the game as a whole, I thought the Canadians, they you know they showed some, uh, they showed some really good uh, puck possession at times, hit a hell of a lot of posts and they just didn't get the bounces their way, to be honest. But uh, with some of the calls that went against them, um, like Savard, although especially the one against Savard, the one against Caulfield, um, it just seems that the Sens were just a bunch of. Uh, it kind of seemed like you know there was a lot of little kids getting learned how to skate, and they were just flopping all over the ice and falling down. Uh, that's how I saw it. It was just it was really, um, you know, we'll get into the Gallagher's comment here in a bit, but uh, I just saw that every time a player went down, an arm went up or they yelled at the ref or looked at the ref or whatever. And like, we talked about this a while back when, when we, when we discussed the Austin Matthews uh, 
uh, game when he gave up on the play and Chetrin came in and scored the winner. You know, until the uh, till the till the uh, till the whistle's blown, you can't give up on the play. And we saw multiple times throughout the throughout the game, just players flopping and throwing their arms up and everything. And nine times out of ten, it led to a it led to a, um, a penalty. Um, there were some players I was definitely impressed with. I would definitely give a shout out to Schooneman. I thought he played a very very good game. Uh, it's very it's really too bad that uh, Barron got injured because I thought he played a pretty strong game, probably strongest one so far with the team. Um, I just, I'm hoping for the same level of uh, kind of grit from the team going into their next game um, against New Jersey, but I want to see, you know, a little bit more second chances because it was a lot of one and done and a lot of posts and a lot of that kind of bullshit um, throughout the, uh, throughout the Ottawa game. I just, I think they deserved a better fate. I don't think Forsberg really played incredible. It's not like he stood on his head or anything. I just don't think the Canadians really challenged him the way that they could have. No, I agree. And and on Gallagher, he played about 13 minutes, got a goal and an assist. And St. Louis has been talking about uh, helping him evolve his game so that he can adjust, <clears throat> manage his energy levels better, and provide more of what he can. He can provide more. He doesn't always have to be the F1. He doesn't always have to be in the mix. You know, he could, he can stay off to the side a little bit. He can work on the cycle. It's these little things that, and we saw a little bit of that in the game against Ottawa, but I agree. The, some of those calls were just asinine. Like the, the Caulfield one where he was, was trying to stay one. online, to stay on side and Joseph runs into him, you know, accidentally on purpose, trying to put him offside. But somehow Caulfield gets the tripping call, even though he was stopped and in his own space. Like he didn't make a move. He just stood Caulfield's there. Caulfield's just this monster of a man. That's why. Oh, I know. So uh, out of all the calls, I think that might have been the dumbest. But the rest, I don't know. I mean, here the tick, ticky tack kind of plays, but overall, I mean, I could agree with them in some way. Drag, what about you? Uh, I commented a lot during the game about the refing. I thought Savard, he just got a penalty for being bigger. Yep. Um, the Suzuki one, Suzuki didn't even move. He just stood there and Joseph ran into him and fell over. And The Caulfield one. Uh, yeah, the Caulfield. I don't know yeah. how, you know, a six foot, 200 guy, pound guy falls over a five foot seven, 175 guy, but okay. Who is standing still. Who is standing still. Um, I thought Suzuki's penalty was a penalty. He, he, he did put the knee out and then, and, and hit him. Um, well, I don't know. I, I don't agree that he put his knee out. He was going in for a hit and he timed it awkwardly, but the knee hit the knee. The knee hit the knee. It's, yes. It's a, sure. Call it a penalty. But I, I would it's accept a definite that. Penalty. I, would, I would accept that. But yeah. uh, the theatrics after were a bit much. Yeah. We're going to get um, into that in a little bit. We'll get into that later. I thought Alan had an off game. I didn't think Alan played very really well. He's tired. <laughs> I thought uh, Montembeau was going to get that game. Yeah. He it looked like he got hurt on a shot there in the third period, uh, but they never they never stopped the play and he never took his helmet off or went to the bench or anything. Uh, but I think I think it was up in his shoulder area. I think he took a hard shot. Um, but I agree with Matt. There's no second chances. Like they they were getting big rebounds that no one was getting to. Yeah. Uh, shooting them in, I think hit two posts. Uh, the bounces weren't going their way. Uh, I mean, Caulfield's goal was a lucky goal that Forsberg should have had just kind of squeaked into his arm. Um, so they got that bounce and they got the interference call reversed, I guess, because, but I think anyone just goes, as soon as Gallagher's in front of a goalie, they're just going to call goalie. The, the other team's just going to ask for replay for goalie interference anyway and take the penalty. So it's nine times out of 10, they're going to get the call. So it is uh, in the NHL flow chart. Is yeah. Gallagher in front of the net? Yes. A goalie interference. But I mean, other than that, I, it just seemed to me that every sense player, as soon as they got hit or got touched or guys, they just looked at the referee. Like they were constantly looking at the referee over everything. And I blame that on the refs because they would call them stupid stuff. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it, I wasn't, a, I didn't enjoy the game. I really didn't like the game to be honest with you watching it. It just, yeah, it, it, it didn't have the same flair that some of the uh, 
yeah. the previous Habs games have had. I, I, and I'm not a big fan of St. Louis pulling his goal with four minutes left down by two. Um, uh, maybe call, call me old school. I think uh, you should wait till at least two, two and a half minutes. I mean, I didn't have a problem with it. You're down two. What's what's the worst that could happen? I, I get it. I just, like I say, call me old school. I, I wait, you know, wait to the, you know, one goal, one minute, two goals, two minutes, four goals, four minutes. If you're down by four, <laughs> pull your goal in four minutes. But uh, uh yeah, I mean, Barron, I thought Barron played all the defensemen. I thought played well, the young guys, Schooneman, Barron, Harris. Overall. Um, uh, overall. Schooneman made a couple mistakes, one mistake that led to a goal, a big one. But uh, hey, Kulak did that all the time. Um, but uh, other than that, I thought it was, thought it was a good game. Uh, I liked the Pitlick, uh, Suzuki, uh, Caulfield line. I think that's a good high energy line. Lacks a bit of defense, but. Uh, I still think Anderson should be on that line because I think he opens up the ice more for them. But I thought Paling had a great game. I know, Matt, you said you didn't think he had a good game. I thought Paling played a great 200-foot game, personally. Um, so on the defensive side, I don't think he had too bad of a game. It was the offensive side. And it was these no-look passes. It was a little backhand passes here. And then – or if they had um, – sustained pressure in the zone puck would go to him he'd bobble it whatever offensively i thought it was a very off game for him yeah he 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 tried to play fancy he tried to do these fancy little plays he's at his best when he's just playing a simple north south game absolutely and we we know he we know he can play the defensive side of it and you know we can kill a penalty he can do this and do that but like when he goes to the net and just makes the simple plays he's an effective player it's when he tries to do these no looks and these little backhand passes not a lot of fucking barely any players can make a good backhand pass let alone ryan paling so yes uh, overall yeah i know i agree i agree he's got to simplify his game if he wants to be more effective um but for the game as a whole, I think that the biggest issue is not just the one and duns. I think the biggest issue is the fact that they could, they kept giving the puck away in their own zone. Yeah. Uh, I counted at least six blatant giveaways in their own zone and a couple leading to goals. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Schooneman giveaway. That one was horrible. I, I found they did a lot of throwing the puck up the middle of the ice they instead did. of up the yeah. boards. And there was always a senator defenseman right there, block the puck, can't get it out. Well, that's uh, where they're supposed to be. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> like Romanoff did it a couple of times. Uh, yep. Schooneman did it. And it just seemed like they just turn around and without even looking, they just try to fire the puck out of the zone and they just fire it up the middle and they go, oh, thanks. You know what I As mean? As if and it's like, a, a new breakout that they've been working on. Yeah. That some of the forwards yeah. don't remember or um, the defense are playing wrong. But it, yeah. that's the stuff that they have to clean up. If they want to have a chance of winning games and keeping themselves in games the rest of the season, they can't be doing that. I thought Yolen had a strong game too. Uh, he played pretty good overall. So. Um, speaking of things you can't be doing, uh, Stutzel. We're going to get into that now. So after the game, well, first Stutzel got knee on knee with Suzuki. We all agree that's a penalty. There's no doubt about that. I don't think it's a dirty play. I don't think he meant to do that. It was just one of those awkward he sees, you know, Stutzel's coming around from the back of the net. He timed, uh, Suzuki timed the hit wrong. Stutzel tried to avoid the hit and they, they collided. Then Stutzel went above and beyond to sell that penalty. You know, the trainer comes out. I thought for sure they were going to amputate his leg there on the ice. He looked like he was dying. But then he was out on the ice, very next shift on the power play. And that, that irks a lot of people. Like there's a rule in the NHL, rule 8.1, where if the trainers come out and it's, it's delaying the game, you're supposed to be checked out. Like there was no TV timeout between the injury and the shift. So they should have, he should have been sitting on the bench for the start of that power play. And then he can go on in the second wave, but they didn't do that. They ignored that. And Gallagher, his post-game comments, Basically calling out, well, not basically, he totally called out Stutzel. Totally called him out. Said it was embarrassing. And yeah. I've got the quote as well. Say it. Yeah. Give us the quote. So, so this is uh, from Brendan Gallagher after the game. He said, when I was a kid, 
our coach had a rule if you lay on the ice. We didn't have trainers. If the coach had to come on the ice and get you, you're too hurt to play. You had to sit for a minimum of three shifts. He's a great player, obviously talking about Stutzel. I've played against him for two or three years now. More than half the games we played against him, he's laid on the ice and he's right out there the next shift, which obviously you just got to. He lays on the ice, you act like he's hurt, he sells the call. He's on the ice, that same power play. You know, there's kids watching, we're role models. If I was his teammate, if I was a teammate of his, I'd tell him to smarten up. It's just not a good look. Very talented player, very good player. He needs to stop laying on the ice. It's embarrassing. And I think we can all agree with his comments. And Stutzel has been known to embellish plays yeah. several times. Yeah. Um, he's even had a couple of embellishment penalties this season alone yeah. um, to the point where there's actually an urban dictionary, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> an urban dictionary uh, uh, definition called the Stutzel, which is to flop, dive or embellish like a coward in order to draw a penalty against an opponent. <clears throat> typically of German descent example, play with some pride. Don't be a Stutzel. <laughs> I like it. In defense of Gallagher, he never mentioned about mm. his diving. He was no. talking about after he goes down on the ice. Yeah. And Selling get, it. Yeah. Yeah. Get back so, up and fucking get yeah. back into the game. So like, I know a guy on Twitter there decided he was going to go on about how Gallagher was a diver and had all these examples of Gallagher diving. And in not one of them was he dive. Not one of them he really dove, but he got right back up. So it kind of was, was, was counterproductive. I don't know why he put it out there. One of them was Sherratt. Well, yeah, it wasn't one of them Sherratt. One of the clips, but uh, <laughs> he was trying to prove that, uh, oh, well, Gallagher dives just as much. But you watch the thing and there's no real dives in it, but he get, the point wasn't to dive. The point wasn't diving. It because wasn't, it was a trip. It, correct. But the point that Gallagher was making about Stutzel wasn't about diving. It was no. about lying on the ice like you just got shot or you broke your leg uh, to even further sell the coach. You already got the penalty. Why are you lying on the ice writhing in pain? Yeah. And then you're and out there when, the very next when shift. You already get, and then the very next shift, you're out there scoring power or to be on the power, which they scored on, I believe. But uh, Eventually. Uh, that one, no, I don't think they scored on that one. Know. They and scored I on know. all the others, but not. I don't yeah. think that one. Uh, but this, but it, it, there's no – what What are you doing? Like, no. You're, you're, it, it is embarrassing. It and is. I wouldn't like that. Like we had a guy when I played lacrosse back in junior that did the same thing. And even us on the bench were like, we just ignored him. You know what I mean? Like, why are you bothering? Like, this is the thing. Like Stutzel can get by just on skill alone. Like, he's got 15 goals and 28 assists. His second season in the league. Like the, the guy is a very good player and he's going to be a very good player. Yeah. However, you know, if you want to, flop around like a soccer player then fucking go play soccer somewhere like it's 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 very embarrassing and it really it really it's um if you know if i'm a if i'm an nhl official i'm now that gallagher's made these comments and especially how it blew up all over all the media outlets if i'm an nhl official i'm looking at this a little bit closer and i'm and i'm starting to question when this guy goes down and is he already got that reputation because over the last he years, does he does that's the thing but i think it's going to blossom that much more now i think yeah. it's going to be i yeah. think they're going to be really looking at him and you know i hope he takes a couple embellishment calls i really do i take, i hope he takes some more yeah. and hopefully someone i think it's going to get to the point where you know he's gonna he's gonna run his mouth and he's gonna do something and someone's gonna take a run at him you don't want to see it happen you don't want to see a guy get hurt but you know, if you dive around flopping off on the ice, someone's going to give you a reason to fucking lay on the ice. The, the biggest thing, too, is Stutzel is a talented player. and he's Very gonna much known, so. He, he's not going to be known as a talented player. He's going to be known as a diver. And, That's right. Uh, uh, you know, and everyone, and everyone but Sens fans see it. So right. it's kind of it's like the P.K. Subban blinders. You didn't see all the slew foots when he was in Montreal until he leaves Montreal. And then you're like, oh, no, look at Subban slew footing everyone. Did yeah. he do that in Montreal? Yes, he did. Of course he did. <laughs> but because you were a huge fan of Subban, yeah. you didn't you let it go. I'm and, looking for oh, since ahead, fans are doing that with Stutzel now. And that yeah. that's you know. I look forward to the next game. The the next game, uh they visit April Ottawa 23rd. on the twenty third. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh we've got a friend that's gonna be at the game, so Hopefully they'll take some good pictures and we'll go from there. Now, I mean, you look at the Ottawa lineup, have, they don't have 
one of those grizzled veterans on their team who could take him aside and say, you know, what you're doing, don't do that anymore. You got the penalty. If even if it hurts a little bit, get up. If you're really hurt, stay there. But yeah. the next time you do this, you're the boy who cried wolf. Yeah. No one's going to believe it. You're showing up the referees yeah. who will then, you know, put their whistles away. They're like, eh, maybe he dove on that or eh, maybe he's not hurt. I'm not yeah. going to. I know, I know DJ Smith made comments afterwards and he pretty much said, oh, we'll make the, we'll let the refs make the calls. And I think that was kind of a wimp thing to say, yeah. you know, like he's already a coach that I don't really have a lot of respect for anyway. And it's not just because he was with Toronto, but you know, just the, you know, during COVID taking the gum out of his mouth and throwing it in the stands and that kind of stuff. The guy seems like he's fucking slob. So, you know, it is what it is. I don't think he has total control of that team either. I don't think he does. I don't think he does either, but with that whole organization, it's a fucking dumpster fire as it is. And uh, I think there's going to be some change eventually come to that organization, but we'll see how it goes. There, There is. And, uh, back to the team itself on the ice i don't think smith has the control i don't think uh this is supposed to be the first year of the five-year window for the ottawa senators and look at their total train wreck because they, like they've I don't got think some very skilled players on their team don't get do. me wrong they've got some very skilled players on their team like uh, you look at Norris, like Norris got 30 goals this year in 53 games. Like there's a one seat, right? He is, he is playing very well um, to Chuck. You know, they gave him the C he's playing with energy. He's a guy that's going to go out there, get under your skin. He'll hit through the boards, et cetera. Um, but I'm, I'm seeing player after player go through that organization that are just really turning into nothing. Like I wish Thomas Shabbat could get out of there tomorrow. Well, he hurt himself to get out. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's that. But back to the um, the Gallagher versus Stutzel dive, so-called dive comments. Um, like like Treg said, um, he didn't say he was a diver. He said that he was selling the calls. Now, the senior writer at the Daily Faceoff, Matt Larkin, made a post about this, pointing that. Gallagher leads the league in penalties drawn per 60. And he said, well, that's a little odd. Go off King, you know, as if to say, huh, why are you saying anything? Cause you're worse. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Well, there's your, Which, there's your pro Toronto media trying to stick their neck out and trying to make, trying to get a couple comments. What I'm getting at though, <clears throat> is he makes this point about, well, he, he get he draws a lot of penalties. Yeah. Well, this year, the leader for drawing penalties is Connor McDavid. Mm -hmm. Because he has drawn so many penalties, according to Matt Larkin's logic, he is a dive and embellishment artist. Well, I mean, Matt Larkin was trying to, he was trying to get clicks. So that's uh, all he was trying to do, um, honestly. But it, a lot of guys came out, I think it was, uh, I don't know, writers came out and said, listen, this is a bad take, buddy. Like, just because yeah. a guy draws a lot of penalties doesn't mean he's a diver. It just means he draws, gets a lot of attention from other players and gets penalties. And then he tried to backtrack a little bit later on, but. Hey, he put it out there. He yeah. made a stupid comment. Yeah. He made a dumb comparison. That's on him. Yeah. That's your yeah. pro Toronto media for you. Looking for just, flags. Yeah. And without question, you look at Ottawa, uh, the Ottawa writers and anything coming out of Ottawa, it is really harsh on, uh, on Gallagher's comments, oddly enough. Well, they've only got about one because the fucking rest of them got the rest of them got fired for all the Toronto people, right? So Yeah, well they, they didn't like it. They didn't appreciate the comments. They, they yeah. like whatever. The bottom line if, is this kid's doing sh this. Shout out to Brent Wallace. He shouldn't have been fired. <laughs> You were saying something? Oh, no, it doesn't. I was just going to say, if Stutzel was on another team, they would be saying the same thing. Oh, yeah, he's a diver. You shouldn't. It, it's like what I said earlier. Fans and the media of a certain team usually put blinders on when it comes to star players. Therefore, you know, that's just how it goes. If, if uh, Stutzel had done this and been called out by someone from, I don't know, Carolina, you know, let's say Ajo said it. No one would care. No, they, they most people would agree with them Maybe. without question. There wouldn't be this big uproar. 
but because it's Gallagher and it's the Montreal Canadiens. In all honesty, most most of the comments is Sens fans. Like even Toronto fans are agreeing, but Toronto fans hate Sens fans. So it's uh, <laughs> Toronto fans are stuck in the middle. They're like, I don't know what to do here. It's Gallagher. I don't want to say he's right, but it's against the Sens, so I have to. So yeah. uh. I just I just find that that kind of thing, what's what Stutzel's been doing, really is a detriment to the game. Like it's it not to the it, point. It, it really just questions the integrity, the whole uh, and, and the whole integrity of it, right? No, it's not to the point of the Ribeiro dive against Boston back in two thousand four, where he was he was writhing in pain like he was shot in the face. But it's almost to that level because he is doing it consistently. Every time he goes down on the ice, he's always looking up at the referee, always trying to sell the call. Just get the fuck up, kid. Just yeah. get up. And before anyone says, well, you don't know what it's like to get hit in the knees. Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> you, you guys can come talk to me when you get your fucking knees replaced. I know exactly what it's like because I got two fake knees. So don't start with that shit. I had someone bring that up online today and fuck you. Um, so from there, we'll move on to something a little bit better. Cole Caulfield. Now, Treg, you had something prepared for him. Uh, yeah, so it's been brought to my attention. And since everyone who follows me on Twitter knows after Caulfield or Pitlick score, I put in where they are in the rookie scoring race and how they're doing. So in the last 25 games, uh, Cole Caulfield leads, and I accidentally put Leafs, so everyone now thinks I'm a Leafs fan, or uh, I get the Leafs in my brain. Closet Leaf fan. Yeah, or, you know, they're in my head, and all I can think about is the Leafs. Yeah, no, it's just a typo. So anyway, uh, Cole Caulfield has 15 goals, 27 points in the last 25 games, which leads all rookies in uh, both categories over the past 25 games. Uh, what makes the 25 games significant? Uh, it's when Martin St. Louis took over. So uh, just to give a point to uh, Rem Pitlick is six with 16 points in, uh, in 25 games. So uh, Go off, King. Um, bunting's right next behind him with 26 points and then it goes down from there but uh well does he count i mean he's what 40 45 well you know and he has 20 goals although uh suzuki has doubled that goal total in the last 25 games or the doubled bunting's goal total he's only had seven in 27 games since suzuki played 25 uh, so, caulfield, you mean. or caulfield yeah, yeah sorry um so i mean Caulfield also played 14 games less than Bunting this year, and uh, he has 36 points, I think, overall. Um, so he is, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of, I would love to see how he would be if uh, we had someone like Martin St. Louis behind the bench all year. I'm not dissing on Dom. Uh, I just, Caulfield just didn't work in his system or in the, with the system he was trying to play. Uh, same with Suzuki and Pitlick and everyone else. Everybody who's doing else. Better. Um, but uh, it'd be interesting to see. Now, I did for a while was going on pace with his points in the 82 ske game schedule with Martin St. Louis on the points he has now. He'd be 87 points. So 50 four, goals. Now would be 47 just because he's kind of dropped. It's 0. 0.6 times 82, whatever yeah. that is. So, uh, um, 49.2. So there you go. 50 goals. Um, so, you know, he'd be an 80 point score. Suzuki be a 90 point score and we'd be actually soon be a bit less, but so he'd be an 80 point score as well, but we'd have a legit scoring duo. A la Marner Matthews, if I could say that, but they play um, defense and produce in the playoffs. Uh, well, Suzuki does have just as many points in the playoffs as Matthews does. So, uh, yeah. In less games. But anyway, um, so my point is, is uh, Caulfield, he's not going to win the Calder, but he's making a good, strong case to the point that he is the player that everyone thought he was at the first of the season. He yeah. probably would have won the Calder hands down if he played with this production all season. And because uh, he'd be far ahead of anyone else in, in points at this point. But uh, uh, so the future's looking bright. The future's looking good for the Canadians. Um, 
And by the way, these are all people that uh, Mark Bergevin drafted. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> uh, well, it's not like he did everything wrong. I mean, the team made the final last year, so he must have done something right. Well, I'm just saying because people say, oh, Bergevin was terrible. He left the cupboards bare. Well, everyone but Justin Barron is a Mark Bergevin product. So, yeah. And on Caulfield, uh, you bring up a good point. Since St. Louis has come back, he's exploded. And it does alleviate some fears people were concerned that he was not the player that they thought they had drafted and it looked like he thought the same thing and now he's got that confidence back he's got a swagger back it doesn't matter if he if he doesn't win the calder because it's going to be more siders calder anyway um but he's going to be finishing off this season knowing that hey i can do this he's on a 50 goal pace under saint louis next year he comes into the season fresh and it wouldn't be unre- uh, unreasonable to expect 35 well he's, he's he's on pace for 22 right now yeah so and if you think about it that's going to be 22 goals in just over 30 games so because his first 30 games he only had one goal and eight points um and he's missed i think I'm gonna, i want to say 14 games i'd have to 14 15 games something like yeah, that he's missed yeah. 14 games so um Yeah. So, I mean, if he can score 22 and what are they got 12 games left? So in 37 games, um, that's pretty good. You know, that that's, I mean, in 74 games, that's 44 goals. Just imagine if they fix their power play. (laughs) Oh, it's, it's, you know what? It, it's looking a bit better. um, Once a game. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, it, they're not scoring much more i mean be, uh, the difference between the power play percentage under charm and saint louis is a, a 0.2 percent difference uh saint louis has improved it by 0.2 percent this the seems biggest, they're scoring a goal more often though in a game on the power play like, well they're controlling the play more they're in yeah. the zone more they have more controlled zone entries under saint louis system than they did under Ducharme's. Okay. now it, it hasn't it hasn't gotten as many goals as you would hope, but it's showing a progression. So they're, they're actually picking up momentum from these power plays as opposed to giving up goals. Like they were shorthanded goals against when Ducharme was in charge. And this brings me to the whole um, Ducharme versus St. Louis comparison, what the teams look like under each coach. Now I don't want anyone to think this is us shitting on Ducharme. He is a good coach. He has done everything the right way, moving up the, uh, up the line. He just, I don't think he was a coach that fit what the Canadians have. The, his players didn't fit his system. You no. Put him, you put him with a team like, say, Boston, and I think he'd be all right. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> but um, I, just, I just put out an article today uh, comparing Ducharme and St. Louis, statistically. So... When you look at the goals for and against, uh, the average goals per game, the average goals per game for the Canadians has skyrocketed under St. Louis. Clearly, they're much more offensive. Defensively, they've improved, but marginally. Um, they're still a negative. They're still in the negatives. They're giving up more goals than they're scoring under St. Louis. So clearly, the defensive side, you need some help. And that's even with an improved goals uh, uh, save percentage from the goaltenders. Under St. Louis, the save percentage is a little higher. He did lose Richardson for almost two weeks, so. Yes. Yeah, and and that does have an impact, especially in a short sample, like a 25-game sample. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, The penalty killing is where the special teams have improved the most. He's improved them by three full percentage points. Really, that's surprising because it doesn't look much better. It, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it really doesn't. They're still giving up a goal every four power plays. Which so, is almost once a game. Yeah. yeah. Well, the way they're doing it, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's damaging, especially on their goals against per game average. Um, high danger chances for, they've given up less high danger chances against they have more high danger chances for so basically everything's pointing to 
Uh, St. Louis, his concepts over systems is geared towards that possession offensive game. So if they can find a way to tighten up defensively while keeping that offensive streak going, this could be a very exciting team in the next couple of years. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to think the last time Montreal had a high, a top five scoring team. Kovalev years, maybe? Uh, no, no. No, they had the top power play then, but they weren't one of the top five goal, goal scoring or teams. Even top 10. Like, I'm just trying to think. It's been a while. I don't think it ever was under Bergevin. Um, no, it was always middle of the pack under him. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, they're moving in the right direction. Um, I think the offensive defenseman that they're getting in and the skating defenseman that they're coming in is going to help because in order to um, improve your offense, you have to have a defense that's willing to provide that offense or help uh, sustain that offense. Um, so, yeah, I think give this team a couple years and it, it really looks at uh, uh, the big debate of what they're going to do. Like, are they going to rebuild? Are they retooling? Are they looking for a fast rebuild or a slow rebuild? Um, I'm, I'm under the impression they're going to try to quickly turn this rebuild into a year three, we should be fighting for a playoff spot type thing. Um, which, depending on how they do it, could be to the chagrin of some fans who want a long-term rebuild. Um, but this team's going to be exciting. You're absolutely right. Uh, but there's no guarantee Martin St. Louis comes back next year. Uh, no. And that's no, not no. on that's not on management. I, that looks to me like it's on St. Louis because according to Hughes, he's already ready to take the interim tag off Martin St. Louis and make him a full-time coach. But uh, it's on the St. Louis end. So we'll, Yeah, we'll I think see. with St. Louis, he's probably just waiting until the season's done so he can assess mm -hmm. what they have in front of him and what Hughes and Gorton are willing to do to meet what he's looking for in a team. Like, like you mentioned, a, an improved blue line. Maybe he wants yeah. them to go after a big name free agent and it has to be a, a puck mover. Or at the same time, they can't sit. They, at the same time, they can't sit and wait too long either. No, no. Because if they go that. out, if they go out and they sit on some of these players, like that, they, that more likely they're going to move guys like Hoffman, Petrie, et cetera. Um, obviously you're looking at a top five pick this year. Um, you, and then it, what happens if you don't, if you do swing for the fences on some of these big name free agents, you don't get them, then you're starting getting your, your, your B options, et cetera. If, if that's the case that you're waiting on your coach and then he's like, ah, oh, you didn't really put the team together that I wanted. And now you're, you know, digging the bottom of the barrel to try to, to try to get a new coach in. I don't think they're going to see anything past the draft day. Like it, all these decisions on whether he stays or goes will be made yeah. by then. I, I personally want to see, like, I want to see him, if he's coming back, I want to know that he's going to be there and I want to see him on the draft floor. Yeah. I think that's, I think it's, it's, it's great for the organization and it's great for all the young guys that are going to be drafted by the team that, that, in that, during that weekend. Cause he seems to fit the philosophy that Hughes and Gorton want that, yes. uh, that possession style offensively tilted type of game. And it's, and it's good and it's good to finally have a player's coach. I, I just think you got to see whether or not was St. Louis just brought in in term on purpose, just because they just wanted him for the year. And then he's going to take some type of management position with the team. Or uh, did they bring him in to say, you know what, what do we got to lose? Let's bring in him to win. Let's bring him in. He wants to be a coach. Let's see how well he does. All right. We're happy. And now, you know what, Martin, it's up to you. What do you want to do? Guy right. Boucher made that comment about him being a third line center so he can turn him to a first line center when what? when he when he becomes the coach of what yeah. yeah i hear stone cold steve austin's theme right now the glass just broke and he's walking in. <laughs> he just got the stunner <laughs> yeah. but he's walking in like vince mcmahon when he oh absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah vince mcmahon with a little bit of d-lo brown thrown yeah. in there you're gonna go <laughs> The head shake going on. That's right. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, if we have time, I'd like to bring this up. Shea Weber. There was talk about Shea Weber uh, and him not being around the team. And there's people, uh, uh, what's his name? Douchebag Kelly, Brendan Kelly. Brendan uh, Kelly, wrote, yeah. Wrote that yeah, article, Douchebag Kelly, yeah. yeah. Uh, about uh, him not being around. And then Marco, De, our buddy Marco D'Amico said, uh, wait a minute here. I think Shea Weber deserves his privacy and to be uh, do whatever the hell he wants. That's right. Uh, Bergevin made it perfectly clear that Shea Weber's done. His career's over. And that he was holding out some kind of hope that maybe a miracle could happen. Correct. In other words, we want the LTIR, so we're not, he's not retired. And plus he wants yeah. to make his money. Well, this all came, this all came up due to the fact that he wasn't there for the team photo. Well, why would he be? He wasn't right. there. All well, year. exactly. Exactly. That's right. And, and, that, yeah. and, but that's what this came from. And I'm like, but, Brennan Kelly, shut the fuck up. But what more do you need to know from Shea Weber? You know, he is hurt. You yep. know, he's not coming back. What else do you need to know? You know, they're making a new captain next year. You yeah. know, they're, they're moving on from him. What, what does him coming? What do they want to do now? Unless they're going to give him a position behind the bench. Mm-hmm. What do they need to bring him? Like, what's he going to do? Go in the dressing room. Going, All right, boys. Yeah. Good job. Well, I mean, right <laughs> now he's out West scouting players in the Western league. And he's been with his family. Yeah. Which yep. Yep. he hasn't been with his entire career. And I honestly, I honestly think you, I honestly think he would have retired by now if it wasn't for two reasons. Uh, this year he was making $3 million, which, you know, I'd want it. Uh, and the other one is he doesn't want to screw the predators over because if he retires now, there is no more recapture penalty for the Canadians, which was supposed to be about 500,000. But now the recapture penalty is, is something along the lines of four to $5 million over the next three years, which is detrimental to the predator. So he still has, you know, he still got connections there. He doesn't want to screw them over. Yeah. I, you know what? I don't think he needs to show up. He was there. He was with the team on the road trip, on the Western road trips. Yeah. He showed up and he said, Hey, what's going on? And talked to the team. He doesn't. Brendan Kelly, listen, this is a PK Subban versus uh, Shea Weber thing that he can't shake. He can't let go. So anywhere he can sit there and bash Shea Weber or make him look bad because the less his face at Shea Weber is a more likable person in the dressing room than PK Subban is. So, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's, anyway, I just wanted to bring it up, get your guys' thoughts on the whole thing, uh, because I thought it was the stupidest thing I ever It read. was. And, uh, and I didn't even read it. I just read the, it's almost as bad. And, and then read the comments. So it's almost uh, as bad as, uh, that, mo- that video montage that Sens fan made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I don't know. I think this is worse because he's doing it constantly. I don't even, yeah. I've got him muted at this point now because it's just because I called him constant. out, but it's yeah. constant. It there's any time he can turn it into a negative angle. Like they made the cup final. Well, now they're not going to get a high draft pick, you know, like anything he can do because of the PK Subin trade. Technically, they did get a high draft pick. But anyway. Um, <laughs> they do now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, even that year, technically, they did get kind of a high draft pick or would have been a high draft pick. Um, yeah. Anyway, just throwing it out there. Um, but yeah, I, he's just, uh, I don't know. If Subban comes back next year, Montreal is all of a sudden the greatest team that ever was put on the ice. Well, that, yeah. Matt, do you think they would actually sign Subban? next year no no i don't think that i don't think it's the right move not for this team <clears throat> they said they're going after high end free agents if they're going after anyone you know what like it's not a high end free agent no. he was a, you know what he was good for the for the crowd he was good for the he was good for all the uh the uh the you know the big moments the big you know the big goal the big assist the big hit the you know the ones that the you know you put up on the, in the front page of the paper and say, PK Suman did this. He did a lot of great things within the community. He still does great things with the community, does things with the hospital, et cetera. Is it the right move to bring him back to the team? I would I'd say absolutely not. He's not the same PK Suman anymore. No. And he's, and he's got more of the reputation of, of being the dirty player and all that kind of stuff. 
And do you want to bring that into the Canadian's uh, dressing room where someone might target one of their players based on one of his actions? I don't think that part is really that big of a deal. For, yeah, I just for don't, I, I, I think, I just don't think it would be a, a good move. You got rid no, of him no, to no. bring in Shea Weber. Shea Weber completely turned around what the locker room was. You don't, you don't, you don't want to take a step back. True. And if you really want a third pairing defenseman that can move the puck a little bit, you already have Weidman. I was going to say Jeff Petrie, but all right. No, he's going to be gone. <laughs> he's really gone. But I, um, Hey, I, I think Weidman's getting a contract from Montreal. So I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't see why not. I mean, he, he does well on a third pairing. He can play a little power play. He can eat some minutes. He's a veteran. I don't see anything bad about signing him at a cheap contract. No, nope. well, yeah, and, and Subban is going to ask for at least five to six million. He's not going to get what he's getting now, but he's going to ask for at least five to six million. I, Why, you know, Why, Wyman's got more yeah. points than, the, than anybody else on defense of the team this year. Yeah. Now, Subban, I loved Subban when he was in Montreal. Uh, he did amazing things when he was in Nashville. But in the last couple of years, the injuries have really stacked up against him, and he's not the same player. He's just not. His so, injuries or the injuries he caused with the slew foot? <laughs> are they equal each other? Right? Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> he hurt um, himself slew footing people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what I'm trying to get at I hurt is, my slew foot foot. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is he's he's going to be asking far too much for what he actually what he is. is. Yeah. Whereas Weidman will be happy to just sign a contract for about a million bucks or less. Whereas yeah. Subin is going to be holding up for, like you said, multiple millions of dollars. And it's going to be, he's going to be a late season signing and he's going to take a cheap deal, I think. And, so and if you're, yeah. if you're going to put a big money for a free agent, go after Latang. Yep. I don't think this year is the year to do the big agent. Like if you're going to go swing for the fences, swing for the fences, but do not sign a, uh, you know, a plan B just leave that spot open, save that money because the saying. following year, Uberdo is a free agent and you can go swing the fences for that. I'm just saying Hughes and Gorton said they want to be big players in the free agent market. But go swing, swing for the fences on the free agent market this year. But if you you whiff. If you're going to get someone, get Latang. If you want the big defenseman, he's the big defenseman. If that's who you want, that's who you get, right? But if you whiff on it, don't go sign a second rate plan B. Exactly. No, don't, which is what Mark Bergevin did. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what Bergevin did. And that's why they're in the cap issue they're, they're in now. Go for it. Take the big swing. You you miss, you whiff, save that money for the following year because you've got a Panarin style free agent in Uberdo who may want to come back home to Montreal. Lane's reaching for clicks here. <laughs> I personally don't think Huberto is going to Montreal, but no. you're right. He, he's the big fish. If that's someone you're going to go after put your money away and say, Huberto, here's 10 million bucks come to Montreal. So you want $10 million you know I mean? for a big fish this year? You miss, save that $10 million in the following year. Get, there's get your the 10 million. Fish. And if you miss on that, well. Then worry well, about what you're going to do. Then worry about what you're going to do then. Yeah. But yeah. So this year is not the way of the year to do it. Uh, well, really. Um, all right. So final thoughts, Matt. Um, I'm all done my training now, other than a cultural awareness brief. So I'm very happy about that. And I've got a beer to celebrate. So cheers. You're not culturally. <laughs> how can you go to Kuwait if you're not culturally aware? Did you so GBA par- plus this? I have GBA plus this. Wow, um, apparently, fine. apparently cultural awareness briefs are only good for two years now. So I have oh, to, I have to oh. redo it. Because culture is always evolving. That's right. Depending on who wants to change their culture. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> to benefit themselves. <laughs> Yeah. Did, I, did I say that out loud? <laughs> it's, it's like a um, chief thing to say. Other than yeah. other than that, uh, last night, Rafael Harvey Bernard put up a four-point game. And um, look out for Cedric Paquette. He's been playing really good hockey down there in yes. Laval and, and giving them a, a good veteran um, in the lineup. So good on them. And uh, hopefully they continue play the playing the way that they have been. I'll tell you why Cedric Paquette's doing really well in the NHL, because that's where he belongs. I think he's making a case for himself to be a depth player somewhere in the NHL. Just if he Montreal. helps, if he helps that team make a little bit of a run, he might get a contract somewhere next year. 
Yep. Never know. Cheap contracts, yeah. you know, for a te- like Seattle. They yeah. just need extra bodies. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Sure. Oh, and uh, shout out to Ryan Getzlaff, who um, is going to be retiring at the end of the season. He's actually not playing the last two games of the season. The final home game is going to be his last game. The classy thing to do. I mean, this team's not making the playoffs. You know, you've been, that's his entire career in Anaheim. He is a duck. He owns all kinds of records there. Why not end, end it with, a, you know, one last lap around the ice? I think that's a nice way to do it. And then next year he signed him with Detroit. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so, Treg, what about you? Any final thoughts? Uh, nope. Moving to Ottawa. I'll be there on the uh, – well, I start work the 15th of June, so I'll probably be there around the 10th. i got a condo on the market, the East End. And that's it. Finalize my lease. Good to go. Mr. Money. That and... IR money is just flying. And I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a new toy tomorrow. So, oh, there'll be pictures. You'll you'll see. It's a, a surprise. A truck. It's a surprise. It's a pickup truck on a it's lift a kit. No flash flashlight. I, I don't it's a Ford a Ford F three fifty. Absolutely lifted. not. Absolutely not. <laughs> With truck nuts on the back. Absolutely. Well, I am going to Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> right by Parliament. <laughs> how fitting uh yeah well and for me for the final thoughts i just want to remind everyone that the nhl draft is in montreal and we are still planning on hosting a post-draft party at mclean's pub the saturday after the draft is complete uh we'll be there around lunchtime i know i'll be able to make it uh, matt you might be deployed uh treg you may or may not be able to make it because of your new position but i'll be there and you know if you guys want to show up you know get drunk i'll be there doing the same thing does mclean's know you're having this party yes yes they do okay they're more than happy to bring in more clientele and judging by my last bar bill at mclean's they will love to see me again how many of those giant uh, tube uh uh pitchers are you getting uh well the last time we ordered six of them yeah. And See, Lewis is... and Gibby, <clears throat> Lewis and Gibby were there from uh, Habilison. They can they can vouch for that. We we polished off about six of those. Yeah. See, that's going to be tough. I'm going to be in a pre prep for my show in October, and it's going to be tough. Well, it, you know, you can, you can do something called throw up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he will at the end of that it. night. <laughs> it won't be no. on purpose. It'll just then happen. you can go over to Dunn's for a poutine at like four o'clock in the morning. Uh, You're good to go. Hmm. Greasy, <laughs> greasy puts in. Yes. You guys are terrible. All right. So I want to thank everyone for listening. Uh, keep sending us, is sending us those emails. Keep sending us those suggestions. Um, we have all kinds of wonderful listeners who send us great content ideas. Uh, if you've been going to games, you know, take some pictures, tag Habs Unfiltered. We'll share the hell out of it because we want the fans to have the best experience and we want everybody to share it. Um, there's a lot of other great podcasts out there. Check them out. Be sure to, you know, still listen to us, but you know, broaden your horizons, have a good time, enjoy what's left of the season. Uh, so again, thank you for listening. And if you were talking about it, so are we.